guys, I'm working on a pretty neat engine. This is gonna be an engine for my personal Supra. It's gonna be a replacement to the stroker I had before I had to sell stuff off to be able to afford to go to Bonneville. So this is a BC 96 millimeter crank. Brian Crowers went ahead and made up a set of titanium connecting rods for me and I have a set of manly pistons for the engine. So it's gonna be the same nine to one compression ratio my car is now, but I'm gonna go from an 86 millimeter stroke to a 96 millimeter stroke. The centerpiece of this build is the Billet BC crankshaft. It weighs 16.4 pounds less than the standard Billet BC crank. I've been using the BC Billet crankshafts in our white six second Supra, and even at an excess of 2000 horsepower, I have not experienced any cracking or bending with the crank. It's been a really solid piece to rely on. When you put the lightweight crank next to the standard version, it's easy to see that there's extensive machining done to remove the weight from the component without affecting its strength. The processes involved in getting the crank to lose so much weight are scalloping the areas that are not stressed behind the main journal, knife edging the counterweights, which also helps it improve move through the oil easier, a pin lightning hole around the rod journals, and then the whole crank is rifle drilled. So there's a hole that runs from the front of the crank to the back of the crank right down the center. Before I install the crankshaft into the block, it's worth noting that the bottom of the cylinders have been notched. This is to allow the rods clearance where they won't hit the block. Remember, the pistons are traveling up and down the bore a full 10 millimeters more, and that distance is going to be seen at the crank throws. So if you don't notch the bottom of the block, you'll get into a situation where the connecting rods will actually make contact with the block. This is a situation that's going to be part dependent, so not all stroker kits will require notching the block and it's best to model them or check with clay as you're assembling. From that point, assembling the engine is no different than any other 2JZ. I still put a little bit of light oil on the back of the bearings so the bearing can slide around as it meets its adjoining bearing. And then from there, I'll just use an assembly lube on the bearing surface itself and go about the steps to assemble the short block. I am pretty excited to get this engine together. It's been over a year in process with me just recouping funds from the money I spent to get the Bonneville and other responsibilities in my life. But I'm really happy to get a stroker back in my car. When I first put my car together, it was with a BC lightweight 3.4 liter and it always performed really, really well. So I'm excited to see what's in for this next chapter. I'm using our Real Street Billet main caps, which I recommend for anything over a thousand horsepower. It's really cheap insurance when you look at the destruction that occurs when a main cap fails. I'm using standard ARP main studs and I feel that these are pretty good until around 1500 wheel. At that point, we started to see some cap walk that we could solve a little bit with better hardware, moving to a 625. But again, this engine shouldn't see 1500 wheel. Remember when you're tightening the main caps down into the saddles to keep things pretty even. You don't want a situation where you tighten one of the nuts all the way down. And then when you go to tighten the other one down, the cap is cocked in the saddle because you can actually slice off a piece of metal that can be lodged under the cap and create some really weird bearing wear. From there, I'm just gonna torque the mains up to the suggested 60 foot pounds with the ARP supplied lubricant. I've had the crank in the block before during mock-up to check the end play on the thrust bearing, and I do that with ATF. It's a very thin oil and it allows me to get a good feel for how the crank turns. Now I'm using an assembly lube, so there's a little bit more viscosity in the oil, so the crank turns a little bit slower. But just keep in mind that if you're gonna assemble an engine with like a grease-based assembly lube, to check it with a thinner oil because the grease will cover up any binding or ill rotation that you have. So if you have a crank that's a little bent, you won't really feel it with that thick paste, but you'll feel it with a thin oil. So always mock up with a thin oil. As you can see, looking at the pistons side by side, one is physically taller. This is due to the compression height difference between the standard stroke and the stroker piston. Also, the dish is larger on the stroker piston. This is because the piston is physically moving further in its travel in the bore, so you have to have a larger dish to have the same compression ratio. The Manly pistons are not new to the Real Street team, and if you go back to the engine dyno video I did years ago, that's when these Manly pistons were developed and improved for the 2JZ platform. I'm using a DLC piston pin. I've been using those since Geo's Silver Super days. With the high stress level that goes on inside of these engines, the DLC coating provides a situation that when the lubricant is displaced, you don't get the pin galling that you would on a non-DLC coated part. It does add expense, but once the piston pin starts to gal, it's generally a recipe for disaster. 
The next really neat part of this build is the titanium connecting rod from Brian Crower. Titanium connecting rods aren't really anything new, but they're not something that you'd commonly find in a build like this because of their expense. This is where it's really kind of a hats off situation to Brian Crower. For years, he's been heavily involved in our segment of the industry, in different forms of racing and part development. This was just literally an idea born out of a conversation. And Brian said, if you're willing to test it, I'm willing to build it. And that's the type of manufacturers that are exciting to partner with because they'll help us move further in the industry and keep up with the higher technology cars that are coming out onto the road. If I ever want to race Gio in his Porsche, I've got my work cut out for me. You can see that I'm working the oil support rail onto the piston, walking it down a razor blade. The oil support rails are generally really tough and easy to score the piston when you install them. You'll be using an oil support rail on any engine that the piston pin bore encroaches on the oil ring land. It's basically just to hold the oil ring in place because the material that would have been there has been removed by the compression height of the piston. When installing the piston rings, be careful to put them in the right orientation. Rings generally not only have a location on the piston, but there's a top and a bottom to a ring. And if you put the ring on upside down, you're going to create some problems. Because this is a common bore engine, I can use this ARP tapered ring compressor. If you don't have one of these tools, I highly recommend it. What you run into with an engine that's been bored and honed is you lose the large, generous taper at the top of the board that the factory had to make the engine easy to assemble during manufacturing. So there's a certain amount of risk involved when the ring pack leaves the ring compressor to make it into the cylinder without catching that edge. And that ARP tapered ring compressor lowers the risk of you damaging a ring during installation by quite a bit. After I install the remaining pistons and rods, I'll install the rear main seal housing, the oil pump, and the oil pans. Then I'm going to put the same Masrux CNC ported VVTi cylinder head back on the car with the same set of Brian Crower 276 cams I had before. So basically what I'll have is an increase of 10 millimeters of stroke, the same compression ratio, and a whopping 16.4 less pounds of things swinging around inside the engine. This should lead to an engine that accelerates well makes good average power and is easier on bearings. So let's get this engine buttoned up, back in the car and hit the dyno. So I've got the engine in the car. I've tuned it up a little bit. Pretty awesome. So at 4,500 RPM, it's up over 250 foot-pounds of torque. That's real power that you can feel driving around. It doesn't make a ton of power yet. I'm gonna switch back to a GT42 turbo kit and 7675 and probably just leave the car around 1,000 horsepower because uh, it's really a good place to be for um, a street car and not have traction problems and just fast enough. 1,000 horsepower is fast enough for me nowadays. So really neat engine, very smooth. Um, accelerates well, spools extremely hard, and I'm real happy with it. Great set of products to put together in one engine, and I can't wait to get my GT42 turbo kit back on and make a bit more power. 